What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pals, Pass Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, and this is WWE Last Week, your weekly look back at the week that was in the WWE. We didn't get one of these last week because I was doing all the TNA stuff, so I do encourage you. I know the preview doesn't mean very much anymore, but go check out my review of TNA Hard to Kill. Go check out my review of the very first episode of TNA Impact. Both of those are available now. No, I will not be reviewing TNA Impact weekly. I just... Uh, my schedule doesn't allow for it most of the time. If you guys notice, compared to back in the day, my shit is really streamlined. Maybe one, maybe two uh, episodes a week because I say life gets in the way, but life's getting in the way a lot. It's the same as the weeks that I do a pay-per-view preview. Typically, you won't get an episode of WWE last week. Uh, same kind of thing, but... It was the first episode of TNA Impact. It was a lot of fun. Talk all about Nick Nemeth and Ash by Elegance and Zaya Brookside and all those people uh, being in TNA now. Talk about Scott Demore and how great he is and their deal with AAA. If you want my feelings on all of that, please go check out my immediate last two pods because it was a lot of fun and hard to kill, I will say. Hard to Kill is a show, if you didn't bother checking it out and you think my opinion means anything, please go check out Hard to Kill. It was a really, really fun show. And the following weekly episode, the first episode of TNA Impact, had uh, Will Ospreay versus Josh Alexander 2, which at, the, at that point in time, 19 days into 2024, is already a runner for match of the year. So I would really recommend, maybe don't go check out the whole show. Not everything hit, I'm not going to lie, but uh, if you've got a good uh, 25 minutes to spare, go check out Alexander Osprey too. It was fucking awesome before we lose him to AEW and we all get very, very sad. But anyways, let's switch gears from TNA to WWE because that's what we're doing. Let's start with Raw. Everything is short notes, so it's going to be a quick note and whatever I ramble off. I really, along with doing less videos, I'm also taking less notes. So it does provide me more opportunity to ramble if I get into a ramble, but it, it, it has allowed me to zero in on the points that I want to make. First point I want to make is all the weather that happened on Monday that uh, led to a slightly mixed up show led to less people being in the arena, led to AEW fans thinking they got a win out of that somehow when they had far less, and it led to us having a very different stage set up. People, hours before the show, were taking pictures from inside the arena. Look, there's a new stage, there's a new stage set up, there's these pillars in the audience or whatever, and I was thinking, that's cool, we've got a new, we've got a new stage, we've got a new stage set up, and it was simpler. It wasn't that it was more extravagant, it was that it was simpler, and I really liked it. And then we found out uh, later on, as the days went on, that there, we're not, in fact, getting a new set, and that that was just what they had to use because they couldn't get the actual set because of the weather, and that was, I guess, a live show stage, but it looks much bigger than the live show stage that I've, that I've ever seen, so I really don't know. It was really cool. It was really simple. Streamlined, stream back. You could see the audience. That was great, and we're getting it once, which is a bummer. Uh, the show entered with Rollins entering with his daughter, which is nice. Mom and dad are both at work. You know, take your kid to work day. It's all good. The appropriate weirdos on X went on to say, oh, look, he's using his kid to get a pop. I'm like, he's in the back. Please be normal. I did this. I said this a lot during the TNA pods I've done in the past couple of days. Just, I know I'm an asshole sometimes, so this makes me an incredible hypocrite. But God damn it, people, just be normal. The guy's carrying his kid around. I'm sure Dusty carried his kid around, and look at what his kids are doing now. They're going to WrestleMania, one of them, and stuck in a terrible company, losing to Christian, the other one, but be that as it may. It, just be normal. Don't target a guy for being proud to be seen with his fucking kid, fucking weirdos. And stop being dickheads to Deanna Perrazzo and Dana Brooke. Just, I'm just, I'm just, just suggestions. Just go out, touch grass, lift your head off the table in the morning, decide I'm not going to be an asshole today. It's not that hard. Started off with a promo. Cody Rhodes in the ring. Cody Rhodes is not my favorite guy. You guys know that. I'm warming up to him ever since the, the, the drunk press conference stuff. But he is a good promo. Let's be real for a second. He was out there. What do you want to talk about? Blah, blah, blah. Drew comes out and he's going to preach the way Drew has been doing about all the wrongs of Monday Night Raw. And I do like 
what they're doing with Drew, and I do side with a lot of people that say this is the coolest thing Drew's done in a while because he's being a heel, but everything he's saying is also correct. Everything he's saying about Jey Uso from a kayfabe perspective is true. Everything he's saying about CM Punk from a, uh, we're gonna take advantage of what happened in AEW point of view is very true. He got fucked out of the championship. Very, very true. He carried the championship when there was nobody in the building, which is also very true. Now, side note, and I know I've said this more than once, I'm really tired of people using COVID to boost storylines. Uh, I'm over that shit. That's not Drew's fault. That's just where the story lies. That's a choice that they're they're making, I suppose. I'm really sick of it. I really am. We've got an entirely, like, gang on gang story later on down the line that's basically based on injuries and I'm kind of sick of that too but basing your shit like I was there when COVID was happening okay other people weren't there because they might have died that's not a post to hang your hat on or whatever the case may be they talked about their their perspective paths they talked about how they both had to leave WWE to become what they needed to be so that they could come back and I'm thinking that this is it's a really cool, and it's not the first time somebody's done this, don't get me wrong, but it's really cool that WWE are allowing these stories to come out of, like, the best thing that happened to me in my WWE career was leaving WWE, because that is kind of a cell phone on the company. That is kind of forcing them to admit, hey, we weren't using this guy right at the time or whatever. Don't necessarily think that would happen in the Vince era. Uh, I think it's, again, it's, it's the company owning itself for the purposes of giving a character a little bit more growth and tell a story between two guys that have had very similar paths. Cody went to, sorry, Drew went to TNA, um, became champion over there as Drew Galloway came back, came up through NXT and started basically from the bottom up, not calling NXT the bottom, but you get what I mean. Cody Rhodes went the other way. He did the indie thing. I know he went to Impact for a little bit. I wasn't watching at the time, so I can't really speak to that. I know he went to New Japan at some point. ROH at some point. Somebody can fill me in down in the box below. And then he went and created AEW. But even he looked around the 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 walls and halls of his own creation and said, yeah, WWE's the better option. And he came back. So they've done all this really, really cool shit. And... They said, you know, hey, you boosted me when I needed it. I boosted you when you needed it. But hey, um, rem- uh, and Cody says at one point, remember what happened in our last match before we both came back to WWE? I beat you. And apparently, I don't know if this is true, but apparently me being a guy that follows what culture, listens to what culture religiously, yes, even the podcasts that have Michael Sidgwick on them, Um, it's really cool to potentially say that the match that they were talking about in that promo was a match they had in WCPW. Uh, I don't, again, I say, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's something they were saying on the podcast to pop the boys or pop themselves or whatever, but that's really cool. And Drew McIntyre then went on to do what most heels say to most baby faces, like, you know, why are you out here being a loser? Why are you out here putting on a smiley, happy face for all these idiots they don't matter why don't you be the real you why don't you be the cody i know you are this is why i don't do accents it's fine and cody rhodes who realistically has no reason or no gripe uh has every reason to be thankful because he's already got a slot for himself at wrestlemania that was decided for him by the fans last year he's like i'm i am grateful i am happy to be here and all that kind of thing um and then we ended on that, hey, remember the last time we had a match? Remember who won? And then he and then he went and fucked off. Drew McIntyre got pissed. At some point in the match, or at some point in the promo as well, he mentioned uh, Damian Priest. And he says, oh, that idiot Damian Priest hadn't cashed in. I'd be the champion already which is kind of true but again it's a little bit of a a little bit of a thread we get a lot of judgment day stuff tonight and it started off with a gag in the back in the i guess the parking area and it's our truth selling bootleg merch that is definitely not bootleg merch because it's available in wwe shop but it's that shirt that they have with all the members of judgment day except jd mcdonough and a fake piece of tape that says and our truth instead which is fine he says oh you know you can't be doing this all the other guys in the group are going to be pissed that you're selling stuff with our name on it and he shuts him up with a with a big wad of cash and says you know we're taking on you and Miz tonight don't tag in 
which is a nice hook for the night. The other half of Judgment Day are taking on the guys that want a shot at the head guys at Judgment Day. It's JD McDonough and Dominic Mysterio versus DIY. Not much to say here. You know what you're getting from DIY at this point. DIY are doing what they did in NXT in front of a not necessarily NXT audience. The people that are getting won over by what they do in the ring are the types of people that will get won over by what DIY does in the ring. And the ones that want it to be more than that, well, you, you, you can't be a good wrestler just because you're a good wrestler, which is a stupid take and a mentality that has kept a lot of people down, if we're honest with ourselves. Um, you, I mean, you look at somebody like Cesaro, who, pro, who rightfully so, I would say, um, has never was never used properly in WWE. I would I would argue has never been used properly in AEW either. But it was because of that mentality of, oh, sure, he's a good wrestler, but what else can he do? Now, think about the damaging effect that had on somebody like Cesaro. Why why would you now implant that on DIY? But, on the other side of the coin, they're facing the Judgment Day B team. J.D. McDonough is kind of a joke. Dominic Mysterio's kind of a joke, even though both of them are really underrated. J.D. McDonough is a great wrestler, point blank, period. If anybody saw Jordan Devlin, what he did in NXT UK and in NXT um, before coming up to the main roster and getting renamed and blah, 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 um, he, is a, he is just genuinely a good wrestler. And... Um, somebody we're going to talk about later on who has a very, very similar gimmick, but he enjoys that, the joint manipulation. I'm going to work your shoulder, then I'm going to work your elbow, then I'm going to go down to your wrist, and when I'm done with your wrist, I've got your hand, your fingers, the whole bit. Now, they made him go a little bit American Psycho in NXT because it was in that weird transitional period from NXT 2.0. That didn't help very much, but he's a really, really good wrestler. And Dominic Mysterio, who we all, myself included, have, we've got to shake this idea at some point of, oh, it's Ray's kid. Oh, it's Ray's kid. Uh, we got a bunch of real wrestlers in there, and then there's Ray's kid. At some point, we got to drop that and realize that for as little as he's been in WWE, he's doing pretty fucking well. His character work is great. Yes, they pipe in the booze. Who the fuck cares? Uh, his, his gimmick within Judgment Day with Rhea Ripley is great. I mean, he's attached to Rhea Ripley, who I would argue... Uh, whether you're talking about men or whether you're talking about women, is one of the most popular people in the company right now without being shoved down your throat like somebody like a Bianca Belair, who we're going to talk about later. Um, I've called them the Judgment Day B team, but I'm almost taking back my own joke because they're not as bad as people say they are, and that's the best I can say. DIY, obviously in there, as technicians, as ring generals, veterans, whatever you want to say, brought them to a really, really decent match. It was never great, but it was, holy shit, that was decent, which is kind of a weird thing to say. DIY got the win. They're the ones in pursuit of the tag team titles at the moment. Of course, they got the win against associates of the champions. Now, I'm going to switch these together because it's basically the same thing. They are trying desperately to do something with the women's tag division. I don't know that they're there yet, but they're trying. Now, they've got two women's tag team matches on the show tonight, which is more than you get women's champion... Yeah, sorry. Say that again. There are two, there are two women's tag team matches on this show tonight, which is more than you get out of women's matches, period, on Dynamite. That was the point I was trying to make. Neither one of these matches even included the champions. So you got four contending teams. You got eight women there, which is a huge check and a huge flex on uh, on another company who doesn't treat their women very well at all. You got Indy Hartwell versus Candice LeRae, which took place because while they were trying to talk to Adam Pierce in the back, Piper and Chelsea were being Piper and Chelsea, and Adam Pierce says, go have a match. And then later on in the night, as a proper like technical spectacle, whatever you want to call it, Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark uh, went over Tegan Knox and Natty again. Yes, we've seen that match before. I don't care. Shayna and Zoe are awesome. Tegan Knox needs to get something eventually, and Natty is like the mom of the women's division helping all of these people look amazing. Now, through both of these matches, not only were they saying, hey, this team could be a contender, 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 they were also driving home more than they ever usually do for a SmackDown attraction. The fact that uh, Katana Chance and Caden Carter will be going to SmackDown this coming Friday to take on Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. They're called the Unholy Union, which is really lame, but that's fine. I like both of them. And they're going to be defending those titles there. And then they're going to come back to Raw and look at all these teams we've got lined up. It's 
fine. It's absolutely, I mean, Caden, Caden Carter and Katana, uh, Katana Chance are getting shit on by people online as well. I don't know why, because, oh, they went out and dared to socialize during the time where we were all stuck in our fish bowls. Fucking get over it, man. Jesus goddamn Christ. Shayna and Zoe should be contenders, but we're going to talk about who the real contenders are when we talk about SmackDown. Now, let's talk about this whole New Day Imperium thing. Vinci got injured for real, so next week in Revenge, we fake injured Kofi Kingston. Gunther made his comeback tonight with uh, Ludwig Kaiser at his side, and they were accosted, not accosted, but verbally accosted, I guess you could say, by a very angry Xavier Woods. Now, I applaud this. I want Xavier Woods to have a set of balls on him. He's the only one in the New Day that hasn't held a world championship. He's the one in New Day that should have held a world championship. I'm just saying, nothing against Big E. I hope we see him again soon. Nothing against Kofi Kingston. He is the quintessential upper mid-card gatekeeper wrestler. He's fantastic. And he's famous for, you know, rumble spots until he botched a few of them. Not a dig at any one of the New Day, but if any one of them was going to have a world title at some point in their career, I wish it was Xavier Woods. That's just me. That being said, any member of the New Day coming out and trying to act angry or act serious makes me laugh. They can't do it. <laughs> I mean, they can do it. WWE has not given me, even the new WWE, even the post-Vince, Triple H, TKO era of WWE has not given me the, the idea that we're going to get super pissed off violent New Day. Like, it's not going to happen. So what did we have? We had Kaiser versus Woods, which broke down into another brawl and they started throwing the chairs again. I will say, I'm very, very critical of AEW when they throw people off of scaffoldings onto concrete and blow up dogs and, and uh, most recently throw Darby Allen into a rope to the point where he himself was quoted in saying that he almost broke his fucking neck while Tony Khan is on press conferences with his fuzzy hat and his glasses talking about how safe the company is. I will put the same lens of criticism on WWE. I love the spots, but the one thing, the most, the most unpredictable, I guess you could say, weapon that you can use at the ringside area right now in a brawl is those the the big commentary chairs, like the big comfy office rolling chairs, because the bottom of those spin, and you can't control that. You might as well do the whole, like, throw a steel chair at the guy's face. You can't hit a guy in the face with a steel chair, but you can chuck an unpredictable item like that, which is much heavier and shape-wise and construction-wise is much more unpredictable at them instead. I don't think it's a good idea. Not saying they shouldn't do it. Not coming out here to tell them what to do. Just giving my opinion, it might not be the best um, item in your arsenal, shall we say. So that was broken up as well. He was interviewed in the back, attacked by Kaiser and... Uh, Sorry, attacked by Kaiser once again during his interview, and he was saved by Jay Uso. Now, here's where I need to give people a little bit of a reality check. And I don't want to do this, because as I said, I do hope that if he wants to, if he wants to, it's his choice, but if Big E wants to and is able to ever come back to in-ring competition and rejoin his buddies in the New Day, whatever, I, obviously I hope he does. Obviously it'd be a huge pop. It'd be a great thing. Rumble, number 30. Y'all want to go big? Let's go big. Whatever, the, whatever his music is, that would be awesome. The fans that are pushing for it, there's a good intention there. But that good intention comes off as very selfish. Oh, Big E's going to come back, and that's how they're going to solidify this three-on-three -three thing that they've got going on. Clearly not, because they're involving Jey Uso in the mix, and Jey Uso is going to be that third guy. Jey Uso, being that third guy, seeing that New Day is down a guy, seeing what Imperium has done to them, with the history that New Day and the Usos have is the best, coolest, most connected long-term story you're going to get from that. You're going to get this trios match at some point. You're going to get it at the Rumble, or you're going to get it at, um, at, at uh, Elimination Chamber. Sorry. Now, what does that mean? It means that a lot of people aren't going to get what they want at WrestleMania, because a lot of people... I would love to see the match. If the Intercontinental Championship wasn't involved, I would love to see Gunther versus Brock Lesnar. Yes, that would be a spectacle. Yes, that would be a really, really cool thing to see. But it doesn't do anything for the Intercontinental Championship 
if Brock Lesnar wins the Intercontinental Championship. And I don't see Brock Lesnar fighting for a mid-card championship either. Um, that being said, there's there's uh, there's Sami Zayn to think about. There's Chad Gable always in the mix. I'm sorry, right now, right now, the guy that I want to see be not only be the one to beat Gunther's record. I know we got a lot of who's going to beat Gunther's record, who's going to beat Roman's record. That's the the dual story that's going on here. But genuinely, who who do I want to see that will carry the Intercontinental Championship as well as Gunther has? It's going to be Jey Uso. Jey Uso is coming out of the bloodline the best out of anybody because he's not in it anymore. Jimmy's a little bit weird. Solo is is going to be going face to face with Roman soon. We'll talk about that later. Jey Uso as a singles guy, as a we're going to throw you on Raw and see if you can swim guy, is swimming and the crowd is with him and it's the. I think it's kind of cool that he's got the like sort of like the hand wave thing he does in the entrance wave because that can't be faked. Everybody complains about, oh, when when Dominic was cutting a promo, they boo him, or, you know, this person that's getting cheers, those aren't real cheers, those cheers are piped in. You can't pipe in an entire arena of people physically doing the, the, the motion with the guy. So, if you want to say that sound is fake, that's cool, that's fine, that's a weird hill to die on. The physical stuff you see in front of you can't be faked. So, Jey Uso has the crowd. Jey Uso was instrumental in what would have become the bloodline. Jey Uso should, and I'm saying it, over Cody, over The Rock, even though The Rock would be awesome, Jey Uso should have ended the story. I'm sorry, that's where they fell down. But if the whole idea is they threw him on Raw to get him away from the bloodline completely to see him succeed, then you gotta let him succeed. At least give him a championship, at most, let him be the one that topples a monster like Gunther to get the Intercontinental Championship, which is in better shape than it has been in a long ass time. So, is it perfect? No. Do I like stories revolved around injuries? No. Especially when New Day's third member is out for a long time, possibly permanently, because of an injury that's also being played up by Ridge Holland on NXT, which is also not great. I don't like how we're getting here with a series of you injure me, I injure you, etc. I don't like the fact that everything is going to a no contest and that Imperium doesn't feel like they're anything until Gunther comes back. That's not super great either, but if you're going to get this altered New Day with Kofi Woods and Jey Uso taking on Imperium, and that gets us to Gunther versus Jey Uso at WrestleMania, I'll fucking take it. It's good. It's really, really good. Um, okay, moving on from that. The champions, Finn Balor and Damian Priest in a non-title match against Awesome Truth. Once again, Truth doesn't know whose side he's on. Blah, 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 blah. He's trying to sell the t-shirts. He's trying to give Finn Balor his cut. He's pissing off JD because JD doesn't get a cut because he's not in the Judgment Day, which is great. You, you gotta be our truth to get something like this over as well. But the whole idea of Damian Priest actually being the one that defends our truth Damian Priest showing babyface qualities uh, throughout the match. We know he's going to turn soon. I think they need to get the Money in the Bank briefcase off of him somehow. He needs to get screwed out of that briefcase to get that last bit of sympathy that helps his babyface character get over the hump if they're going to break up the Judgment Day. But that's another, that's another story for another day. Um, he beats up our truth and feels bad about it, and that's about it. We're left with our truth, you know, being the typical lost guy that he is. And the Miz is just kind of the other guy that's there in this scenario. You know me, always going to back the Miz, always going to say, I hope he has. I hope he either has something really good or really fun to do at WrestleMania, because when he's got nothing to do at WrestleMania, and it's just some stupid segment or, or whatever. It's still awesome. Yes, we saw the Shane McMahon thing where Shane McMahon was replaced by Snoop at the last minute and we saw the worst rock bottom in people's elbow in captivity, but he makes that kind of stuff fun. So Miz, give him something fun or give him something he deserves at WrestleMania. I, again, a separate story for a separate day. It has nothing specifically to do with this, but he was so the guy not in his own match in this scenario so that we could play out this... Priest is sort of buddies with Truth, but everybody else is looking at him saying, what are you doing? The exact same way that Priest looked at Balor when Balor wanted JD in. It all works. Miz is kind of standing there through it, though. So that's all I have to say about that. But after that, 
the real boss of the Judgment Day comes out. Rhea Ripley comes out to basically talk about how fucking great she is. She's going to address her division. Anybody that wins the Royal Rumble better. F it was a, it was a sly dig at Io Sky as well. He's like, if you win the Royal Rumble, you better go for that other title. <laughs> Because it's not going to be a good day for you, etc. And I was really afraid that she was going to get interrupted by Nia Jax. And we cannot, we cannot waste this pay-per-view in Rhea Ripley's home country giving her a match against Nia Jax. Listen to me carefully. We cannot waste a Rhea Ripley title match in Australia against Nia Jax. Conversely, we're not going to waste the Rhea Becky match on Australia, because that's a WrestleMania match. That should main event one of the nights. That deserves to main event more than Cody and Roman. Let's shout it from the hilltops. The main events this year, outside of something we're going to talk about later, should be Rollins versus Punk on night two, Becky versus Rhea on night one. Is that going to happen? Is it going to go the way I want it to go? Is it going to go the way it should go? Absolutely not, but I'm still going to shout it from the absolute rooftops, even though you can't see the rooftop because this is an audio platform. It's fine. She comes out, Becky comes out, and talks about, you know, very, very similar to the opening promo, actually, you know, we're two people that came from, from faraway lands, and we didn't do much at WrestleMania one year, only to own WrestleMania the next year. The only difference is, you want a title, and I want a title, but I did it in the main event of WrestleMania. But then Becky also says... Uh, she goes the, the, the vulnerable route and says there's a nagging voice in the side of my head that tells me that you're better than I am and I have to shut that voice up pretty much. Rhea, it's kind of an interesting position for Rhea as well because she has to be sort of like the dominant asshole heel but she's been dominating everybody so you can believe her having like a monster's boredom. Like when you get two giant guys in the ring, it's like when uh, Brock Lesnar was in the Rumble and then Keith Lee came out and he sort of laughed to himself and said, who's this big boy? I, I gotta believe that Rhea Ripley's looking at Becky Lynch in that same way. It's like, oh, fucking, finally, a real challenge. And she even says as much. She says, there's only one person that wants you to win the Royal Rumble more than you, and that's me. And then they basically say to each other, see you at WrestleMania. Like, that's all we need. That This face-to-face -face was all we need. Don't do anything else. Have her win the Rumble. Don't even bother with the, oh my god, which champion is she going to pick? derp a derp a derp a derp Nope. Have her win the Royal Rumble. Have her do it by the skin of her teeth. Have her do it, do it last eliminating Nia Jax, because that'll complete that cycle and get Nia Jax hopefully out of our lives. Have her not even able to stand, grab the microphone, and say, Rhea, you're damn right, I will see you at WrestleMania. Have that be the end of that. Have that main event. Have the, have the women's Royal Rumble main event and have that be the last thing we see, the last thing we hear at the Royal Rumble. That would be fucking awesome. Now, Tozawa beat Ivar. That was fun. And then and then uh, Valhalla beat the shit out of Maxine and Tozawa. Yay. So next week we're going to get Ivy Nile versus Valhalla, which will be a lot of fun. We're going to get Chad Gable versus Ivar, which will be a lot of fun. Apparently... Now, if you believe this, I don't know if you believe this or not, apparently Ivar is being tapped, not, not for WrestleMania, but for after WrestleMania. Apparently they're tapping Ivar next year to win Money in the Bank, which is terrifying because not only does that give him the briefcase and put him in the, in the main event title picture, but that means Ivar in a ladder match, which is fucked. Unless you want to go in entirely big boys. Uh, match, throw in him, throw in Bronson Reed, have Eric come back, uh, put Otis in there, put all the big guys in there, and have like a big guy ladder match. I'm gonna be there. It's gonna be in fucking Toronto. I'm going. Give me Ivar in a ladder match. That's fine. It's also very strange, and people who are saying that that there are a million other options are also are also right. So we're gonna see Chad Gable next week taking on Ivar. He's gonna throw Ivar, and everybody's gonna go holy shit because it's Chad Gable. And, I mean, Ivy Nile's going to throw Valhalla around for a little bit because they still don't know exactly what they're doing with Sarah Logan, do they? They really, really don't. I'm not going to say much 
about the main event because the story coming out of the main event is more important. It was Rollins versus Jinder Mahal. We all saw Rollins sort of pop up awkwardly at one point after hitting the pedigree. Apparently he's torn his ACL and his meniscus and we don't know what that means for Rumble. We don't know what that means for Chamber and we don't know what that means for WrestleMania as a whole. So the bigger story here is people on Twitter that are celebrating this as some sort of win against WWE are assholes. And it also means that the bigger story here is we hope Seth Rollins is okay. We hope he doesn't have to abdicate the championship. And we hope that the rightful main event of WrestleMania, Seth Rollins versus CM Punk in night two, sorry, can still happen. That, that's the big story here. The, sto the fact that Jinder came out with Indus Sheer and they were all out there to, to make it a numbers game. The fact that Damian Priest was out there with his Money in the Bank briefcase sort of playing mind games with Seth, but that was nullified by a brawl with Drew McIntyre leading to a match that they're going to hap have next week and all that sort of thing is all kind of secondary. Like, Indus Sheer, they've tried about five times to reintroduce Indus Sheer and people don't care. People are now going after Jinder Mahal because Tony Khan told them to and people are weird. We're getting McIntyre versus Priest next week in a one-on-one -on -one match. That match should fucking rule. None of that supersedes the fact that uh, Seth Rollins is injured and we just hope he's doing okay. That's it. Oh, and sometime in amongst this match they also announced, because CM Punk, CM Punk was uh, originally announced for this show tonight, but I guess he was one of the ones that was set aside by, by travel issues. Uh, so he's going to be there next week, and uh, basically he put something out on social media that said, Hey Cody, it's about time you and I had a conversation. I don't want to write... Seth Rollins out of WrestleMania. I really don't. CM Punk versus Seth Rollins is a match that I really want to see. But there's a problem if Seth Rollins can't. Big if, big capital I F if Seth Rollins isn't available for WrestleMania and he has to abdicate the championship. There's a big challenge or a big uh, problem that WWE has right now with some overly opinionated fans that say The Rock can't face Roman. That's Cody's blah 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 blah. I submit this to you. The only way to solve the Rollins not being there anymore problem is you do Rock Roman, there's your SmackDown title sorted out. You have CM Punk win the Rumble, say that he wants the world title, but say that he doesn't want it handed to him. Adam Pearce on Raw does a mini tournament, Cody wins the tournament, and you have Cody Rhodes, CM Punk for the vacant world title at WrestleMania. It's not great, it's off the back of a horrible injury, it's... It's one of those things where you always say, oh man, what a terrible time to get injured. Well, nobody ever wants to be injured. Nobody ever says, ah, you know, I'll get an injury in April and then I'll be back for WrestleMania. Nobody says that. But it is a really shitty time to be injured. And we all know Seth Rollins has had problems with his leg all the way back from that house show where he did that weird flip in the match against Kane and came down and fucked up his leg the first time. Um, I don't want to hear that Rollins can't go to Mania. I also don't want an injured Rollins to force himself to Mania just because I want to see that match. That's about as even-keeled as I can go. If you can't, give us Rollins versus Punk. Give us Punk versus Cody. There's so much story there that can't really be said, but everybody just kind of knows that it'll carry itself. People want Cody to have a big moment at WrestleMania. People want Cody to main event night two of WrestleMania and win a championship. Now I would still have CM Punk win. That's another story altogether. As I say, all of this speculation, all of the criticism that this match got for existing on Raw when you knew there wasn't going to be anything coming out of it anyway, when it was kind of meaningless and it was only spurned on by one crackhead who just needs to get off social media, um, all of that goes to the wayside in favor of, hey, I hope Seth isn't too fucked up. I hope Seth Rollins can come back. Especially, and you know, you don't want to co connect the two because they have two very individual careers, but this could be one of the biggest matches in Becky's career at WrestleMania. So for her to go in against Rhea Ripley, possibly in one of the main events of WrestleMania, and think about her husband 
either being at home waiting for her in the locker room, waiting for her at the hotel, not able to participate at all, it would be a shitty situation for both guys because, or sorry, both people, because she'd be feeling bad that he can't participate and he'd be overcompensating and saying, hey, don't worry about me, go have your moment. And it really wouldn't be good for anybody as an injury never is. So like I say, nobody ever wants to get injured ever, but ultimately it is a really shitty time to get injured. Um, people are blaming gender again because cracky con is telling them to which is also weird industry didn't need to be involved in here there was enough other people around the outside from a storytelling point of view from drew to to um damian priest to everything to the news about cody and and cm punk next week there was enough going on you didn't need to throw industry out there as extra bodies in my personal opinion but that was raw we rambled through that in 34 minutes, and I've still got two more shows to go through. NXT is going to be really quick. I'll hit it to you like this. The semifinalists in the Dusty Classic are Trick Mello, Corbin Braun, Axiom Frazier, and the LWO. Nice to see the LWO guys on NXT. It's a good, fun time, considering they were always heels. Like, Legato were heels and tweeners at the best of times. They were never straight up baby faces in NXT, so to see them get a pop is nice. One thing I didn't get a chance to talk about last week was Obafemi uh, coming in and destroying and picking up the North American Championship. The crowd is already behind him. He's a fucking fridge. Dragon Lee confronts him, wants a rematch. He says the open uh, the open challenges are, are done and dusted now. But he says he wants to fight him at Vengeance Day. He says, no, we're probably going to get that match anyway. Dragon Lee versus Obafemi is going to be amusing because Dragon Lee's on the main roster. He doesn't need the championship. Obafemi's going to kill him again. Now, Trick Mello, they, went to the, they advanced to the semifinals this week, but they're celebrating in the back, and Ilya Dragunov has returned uh, from the injury story from Rich Holland, which shouldn't be a story, but it is what it is. Trick Williams says, hey, I've already talked to Sean, I've already talked about Vengeance Day, you're going to get your shot, I'm sorry you didn't get your shot at New Year's Evil, I'm going to give you your shot at Vengeance Day, I uh, hope that makes up for it, blah, 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 I'm kind of, if I'm Trick Williams, I'm kind of glad, because New Year's Evil was an elevated weekly episode of NXT, whereas Vengeance Day is a proper arena show, so if you're going to win that title, do it on a bigger stage, I guess, Carmelo says, hey man, you know, why are you focusing on that? I guess you got your title match now. I guess you don't care about the Dusty Cup anymore. Trick goes and thinks about it, and his wild solution is, I'm going to have both. So, there's going to be some chicanery afoot. Either they're going to lose, and Carmelo's going to turn on him, or they're going to win, and Carmelo's going to turn on him, or Carmelo's just not going to tag in, and Trick's going to get his ass handed to him so that he's really, really roughed up going into his Ilya Dragunov match. Um, the Trick Mellow thing is gonna happen at Vengeance Day, whichever way it goes, whichever way the, the chips fall, because if they win, they have to stay together a little bit longer, because I think they get a tag team championship match out of it, um, but them versus the family, it, it, I like both teams, but they're not two teams I need to see fight each other, and we need to fast forward to what the actual end game is, the actual end game is gonna be Trick versus Mellow at Stand and Deliver, let's let's be real for a second, unless one of them shows up in the Rumble, but that's that's a weird scenario as well. Lyra Valkyria had a tag team match, and they're playing up this this angle where Tatum Paxley is a stalker of hers, even comes to the ring dressed like her while, while they're taking on Electra Lopez and Lola Vice. Lola Vice still has her breakout contract thing. Um, basically, Tatum Paxley got knocked out, but she fell on her opponent for the pin, and they won by accident which is nice. I don't know. Lyra Valkyria is awesome. I don't know why they're doing a weird Mickey James-esque stalker angle with her and Tatum Paxley. I don't know where Tatum Paxley disappeared to before this came along, to be perfectly honest with you, but it is what it is. And then the main event was a women's battle royal slash fatal four-way match. They did, they did uh, acknowledge the fact that... Uh, at a house show, Cora Jade, who just came back from injury, got injured again. She's got knee stuff very similar to Seth Rollins, from what I can tell. I'm not a medical person. I'm not a news person. So I've just heard that it's very similar to what happened to Seth Rollins, and that's it. Um, the girl that she allegedly was in a match with at the house show, 
uh, was put into the Battle Royal as her replacement, which, I mean, in kayfabe or in real life, that sends a mixed message. But also, I've heard through the grapevine that she wasn't actually facing that chick at the house show. She was actually facing Lyra Valkyria. Now, you don't want to advertise that point. I get it. But, you, like, you took the time to put it on somebody else, which is weird. It's very, very strange. I don't get it. Um, nothing against anybody, whether it was Lyra, whether it was this new girl, um... Uh, Maddie Renkowski is is her indie name. I don't know what her NXT name is. I didn't write it down because I'm special. Uh, I don't hold it against her if it was her. I don't hold it against Lara Valkyria, obviously, if it was her. You don't want to see anybody get hurt at the end of the day. And I think Cora Jade is a lot better than a lot of people give her credit for. I think if she didn't get injured, she would have been a shot as, as the, um, what do you want to call it, the Royal Rumble surprise entrant call-up, whatever you want to whatever you want to say. So that's that's not that's not great. Uh, it went down to a fatal four-way at the end, uh, as it was announced last week, and the winner is Cor uh, Roxanne Perez. I was going to say Cora Jade there, because I was just talking about Cora Jade. Uh, the winner was Roxanne Perez. Roxanne Perez versus Lyra Valkyrie is going to be an awesome match. Roxanne Perez has been sort of teetering on like this 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 anger issues thing that she's doing so I predict that she's going to lose to Valkyria at Vengeance Day and then lose her mind and go heal for a little bit which is fine but it's kinda like what they did with Braun Breaker everybody was so sure that Braun Breaker was about to get called up to the main roster when instead they kept him in NXT and gave him a heel turn if they give Roxanne Perez a heel turn that means she's staying in NXT for a while to fight some of the baby faces um, I don't think you need to do that I very much think you could introduce her in the Rumble and just announce the next night on Raw that this is Roxanne Perez and she's the latest member of the Raw roster and everybody fuck off. Um, Roxanne Perez versus R Rhea Ripley as a, as a weekly episode of Raw title defense has some awesome sort of David and Goliath type potential. I would really like to see that, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah... So we've got Trick versus uh, Ilya Dragunov at Vengeance Day. We've got probably Obafemi versus Dragon Lee at Vengeance Day. We've got Lyra Valkyria versus Roxanne Perez at Vengeance Day. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say, uh, the two stars that have been pushed on NXT, one for a lot longer and, and one who's just come off of the um, breakout tournament, finally came into each other's orbit and started building a potential tag team and that's Eddie Thorpe and Trey Bearhill and basically Trey Bearhill being the new guy in, on the roster sort of gave him credit for the NXT Underground match he had a couple weeks ago they're both dealing with assholes one of them's dealing with Dijak one of them's dealing with Lexus King um you know, hey, it's really cool that you're here representing our culture and they talk about which tribe each of them are from I don't want to gloss over that because it is important and representation is important and all those kind of cool things are important but it's also again we're getting into stuff that I'm not familiar with so I'm not going to talk about it because it's not my place to say really realistically it's uh, kind of like when people ask me what I thought of uh, Echo the new um, the new Marvel thing on Disney Plus which was also very like native culture based and all that kind of thing I was like I like it I thought it was a good enough show uh, from a cultural point of view, I'm not the one that can talk to you about the cultural impact of it. I think it's really cool that Marvel had a lot of people on an advisory board saying, like, let's teach you about our culture a little bit so you can weave it into the show and whatnot. Whether they did it successfully or not is not for me to say. What they're going to do with this here, with Eddie Thorpe and Trey, and Trey Bearhill potentially maybe being a tag team, probably taking on Dijak and, and uh, Alexis King, let's be real for a second. Um, will it be good? Will it be bad? Who knows? They're establishing that they're not just a thrown-together tag team. They have sort of like a family bond in a different way through their shared culture and all that kind of thing and I think that's a really cool thing to explore I also think WWE yes in the past has a horrible history of taking something like this and going very wrong with it so I don't know I don't know what you want me to say I'm interested let's just say and uh, and Von Wagner wants to go f for the for the Heritage Cup that that's it he thinks he has to pin Noam Dar for a six count Love Von Wagner. It's fine. Everything's fine. Moving on to Smack. I don't know. I don't know what to say about Von Wagner going for the Heritage Cup. He's not going to win it. Uh, it's going to give Noam Dar 
a lot of more a lot more chances to just do funny Noam Dar promos where he he used to be known as the guy that said Alicia Fox. Now he's just the guy who gets in arguments and says no. I I don't I don't know what NXT thinks Noam Dar is. Is that a fair thing? I like Noam Dar. As, as an in-ring talent, as a character, I think he's funny. In the ring, I think he's really underutilized, in a sense. I think when they took away the cruiserweight, nothing else to do, and they sort of handed him the Heritage Cup and said, here, do this for a while. And it puts it on par with R-Truth and Drake Maverick fighting over the 24-7 title, which isn't great. But I do like the Heritage Cup in concept because it's a different type of match. Not going to say very many nice things about AEW or ROH, but I do think the pure title and the pure rules matches are an interesting thing just for no other reason than they're a bit different. That's it. That's all I really need. The Heritage Cup is a little bit different. That's that's all. Moving on to SmackDown. Moving on to SmackDown, we started off the night with what was supposed to be the contract signing for Roman versus AJ versus LA Knight versus Randy Orton. Uh, three of them came down. It's all, it's all headed up by Nick Aldis, who's not taking any shit from the from the bloodline. I was about to say the Judgment Day. Don't worry about it. Uh, AJ signs it. LA signs it. Orton signs it. Heyman comes out and says that he won't sign it because they haven't had a chance to see the contract yet, which is fine. AJ and LA Knight brawl to the back. Randy Orton threatens Paul Heyman, and we move on. At one point, LA Knight said he was going to peel some bacon off of Paul Heyman's back, which is nice. Uh, we get another trios match between uh, Legado, the new Legado del Fantasma, which is Santos and Angel and Umberto, taking on the LWO once again, Cruz, Wild, and Carlito. The heels get the win. It's fine. It is what it is. If the rumors are true and Andrade is going to get involved in this whole thing, that's awesome. Otherwise, it kind of feels like we're spinning our wheels a little bit on this one. I'm not going to lie. I like all the guys. Bring Ray back. Put him on one side. Bring Andrade back. Put him on the other side. Bring Bad Bunny in as the referee. Do all, do all the things that everybody wants you to do. Make it the most gigantic lucha pile of people match you can possibly make it. Make it a huge spectacle. Make it over the top. Put it on WrestleMania. But until we get there... Until we get there, it does feel like we're spinning in place, which is which is kind of a bummer, because, like I say, I like everybody involved. And I like the fact that without Santos, Cruz and Wild are actually getting to have a bit of their own personality, because Carlito kind of pulls it back and lets them do their thing. Other than last week on NXT, when they did that huge catapult to Cruz del Toro all the way up the fucking ramp on NXT. That was fucking goaded. That got gift to hell, and it deserved to be gift to hell. Lashley and the Street Profits in the back calling out Final Testament. You know, if you want, we're just business guys. We're in business suits. We can still get the job done. If you wanted a match with us, why didn't you just say so? Which is nice. Apparently, internally, it's being rumored that this trio of Lashley and the Street Profits is going to be called the Pride, which is why they're making all the animal metaphors. That's really lame. I think Cross's group being called the Final Testament is also really lame, but I'm interested to see what they do. They do a video back and we're gonna we're gonna show you what violence and, and instability and all this stuff really is. I like the style of the videos, but it is it's a little bit of the criticism that Bray Wyatt used to get, R. I. P. Um that he would go in there and he would say a bunch of stuff and it would sound really good, but it didn't really mean anything. Cross is really good at that, and Paul Ellering is really good at that, and AOP are really good at standing in the background and looking scary while they do that, and Scarlet is hot and can do whatever the fuck she wants, I don't care. We're going to get this trios match. Eventually, it's fine. Pretty Deadly wanted a rematch against Tyler Bate and Butch. They didn't get a rematch against Tyler Bate and Butch. They got a rematch against... Tyler Bate and Pete fucking Dunn. Get in. Came out as Pete Dunn. Came out as the bruiser weight. Commentary were putting him over as the NXT version of Pete Dunn. As the version that I saw fight for the Destiny Championship at Destiny against guys like Josh Alexander and John Morrison. Yes, check it off your Spaz Phoenix bucket list. I don't give a shit. We have Pete Dunn back. And oh, it's just a name change. Cool. Tell that to LA Knight. He went in there, he destroyed them, he destroyed their fingers, they complained afterwards that they were bait-and-switched, that they were told that they were fighting Butch, and they got Pete 
gun instead, which is exactly what Pretty Deadly should do. That's fine. I want these two in a match against Austin Theory and, and Grayson Waller. I really do. Um... Obviously they won. Pete Dunne is Pete Dunne again. Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate are a tag team. Tyler Bate is on the main roster, uh, which is also awesome. Um, speaking of, sorry, I should say, speaking of Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, Austin Theory's great. He's going to be, or Austin Theory's physically, after the big scary moment last week that they had, I don't even want to think about it. Um, everybody was worried about Austin Theory. Everybody was worried about Carmelo Hayes. Obviously, Carmelo Hayes competed on NXT, so he's fine. Austin Theory is going to be fine by next week. They're going to have a rematch on the go-home show to the Royal Rumble, which is absolutely fine. Um, Kevin Owens and Logan Paul had a promo thing in the ring, and it was pretty lackluster. I like Kevin Owens. I really do, but it was really, really lackluster for a Kevin Owens promo, basically doing the very, very cliche, you're a celebrity, you're not one of us, shtick. Logan Paul basically called him out on using the cast last week and giving him a legitimate black eye. Kevin Owens took the cast off and said, fine, here, if you're going to bitch about it so much, I'll take it off. So Logan Paul put it into the post again and knocked him out. And he got up again, but he got knocked out again. And they're going to fight at the Royal Rumble, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I didn't need to see another promo about this, and I don't need the hand story. I really don't. Katana Chance and Caden Carter defeated Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. In about two minutes, Isla Dawn and Elba Fire continue to be treated less than great. Um, the real story is Damage Control were all on the outside outs after the... Sorry, they were all outside by commentary while this match was going on. Asuka and Kairi Sane were, got their hands on the tag team titles. Brought them in the ring after the match, sort of challenging them, not giving them their belts back right away until the referee yelled at them. And it was announced that that match for the tag team titles is going to happen next week. Why isn't it just happening at the Rumble, just do it at the Rumble. I have to assume that there's going to be some fuckery and that these four women are going to lock up at the Royal Rumble for a proper title match. If you keep putting these titles on the show, either right before the pay-per-view or right after the pay-per-view, it's like a step behind even putting them on the kickoff. And if you want, if you've done all this work on Raw, Indy and Candice, Piper and Chelsea, Shayna and Zoe, Tegan and Natty, all the members of Damage Control... Ela and Alba, uh, Case, uh, yeah, Katana Chance and Caden Carter. You're trying to build up this division. You have to show that these titles are worth being on a show. And especially when you've got two challengers like Asuka and Kairi Sane, put it on the pay-per-view. I assume there will be fuckery next week on SmackDown and they'll get a rematch on the pay-per-view. That's the only thing that makes sense. LA Knight versus AJ Styles was a match that was made at AJ's demand. New, dark, AJ, I wear cargo pants to the ring now. AJ Styles demanded a match with LA Knight. They had a match. It went on for a little bit. Uh, Jimmy distracted them on the rampway, and Solo beat the shit out of both of them. Solo grabs a microphone and says, that's two down and one to go. Calls out Randy Orton. Um, a lot of fuckery on the outside once again. Jimmy comes back out. AJ comes back out. LA Knight comes back out. Solo comes back. Or, sorry, Solo comes out of the ring. They all fight on the outside. Orton kind of sneaks himself a win, which is kind of shitty for a babyface, but it is what it is. Um, he hits an RKO on AJ. He hits an RKO on LA Knight. Roman Reigns comes out from the crowd. Hits him with the Superman punch, thinks he's going to stand tall. Goes for the spear. Spear gets countered into an RKO. Um, shades of every Orton edge match ever, if I'm completely honest. And Randy Orton stands tall. So Orton got fucked with. Bloodline kind of let AJ and LA Knight fuck with each other. And that was the story. WrestleMania, I predict, we're going to get... Orton turning his attention to AJ Styles, LA Knight turning his attention to the US Championship, and Roman probably turning his attention to Cody Rhodes. Let's let's be real for a second. As much as I would love to see Rock and Roman, and it makes more sense, and Orton and Cody makes more sense, and Punk and Rollins makes more sense, but Punk and Cody could make more sense if we wanted to book it like assholes. Um, we're getting Roman and Cody, aren't we? We're getting it whether we like it or not. But hey, if I get LA Knight versus Logan Paul, if I get Jey Uso versus Gunther, if I get Punk versus Rollins and he's healthy enough, if I get Bailey versus EO, if I get Rhea versus Becky, I guess, I guess I could swallow 
Roman Reigns versus Cody. I suppose I'll be generous. Anyways, that's all I got. There's a lot of a lot of wheel spinning. A lot of things are running along really productively, but they are just running all along. Pete Dunn being Pete Dunn again popped me more than. Uh, I shouldn't say more than anything else. The face-off between Rhea and Becky popped me this week. The return of Pete Dunne as Pete Dunne popped me this week. The so-so uh, successful uh, attempts that they're making to make us care about the women's tag division is also there. The New Day Imperium story, even though I don't like it starting out of like multiple injuries, I think that's a little bit off. I think whatever they do with it is going to be great. If we get Jey Uso versus Gunther, that'll be worth it. Um, apparently Rhea Ripley is main eventing Elimination Chamber, so she's going to come off of main eventing Elimination Chamber and then go to WrestleMania to face Becky Lynch. That's not terrible. We're in a pretty fucking good place. And even if you don't like everything that's going on here, you can go back to podcasts and listen to me talk about TNA because it is very important. Even though WWE is doing very well right now, you got to lean your eye over to TNA every now and then because we do need a proper palpable alternative. Do we not? I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation, keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, I am tagging out. Bye, guys.